Well, I uh, don't usually go in for Christian clothing, but I saw this T-shirt earlier in the week, and I, qu- I quite liked it. Uh, in case you can't see the writing on it, it says, The meek shall inherit the earth, if that's all right with everyone else. Unfortunately, the, uh, the people who make it, they don't ship to the UK, so I don't have new clothes to preach in uh, this Sunday. Um, but I, I quite liked it. And maybe it gets to the heart of what we think of when we hear that word, meek. Uh, the meek there a bit of a pushover. Uh, They wouldn't say boo to a goose. They're they're a doormat that we can uh, trample on. And I don't know, but I think in our culture, if you describe someone as meek, it's quite dismissive, isn't it? Um, Meekness is is weakness, I think, particularly if we're looking to get on in the world. If we want to do that, well, we need to be powerful and assertive and take life by the horns and go out and make something of ourselves. And of course, that's not just a modern uh, phenomenon. If you were here with us earlier in the year when we were looking at the life of Jacob in the book of Genesis, you'll remember how grasping uh, he was, how he did everything in his power to try and make something uh, of himself. It's not a modern idea, and yet Jesus is clear. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, uh, or we could say the gentle, uh, or the humble. It's another way that word gets translated elsewhere in the New Testament. Blessed are the meek, the gentle, the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Well, this morning we're going to dig into Jesus' words to understand uh, how that can be so, that the meek will inherit the earth. And if there is blessing to be found in being meek, Well, how can we cultivate that blessing in our lives? Uh, But before we do that, let me just take a a step back and remind you of where we are as we come to the Beatitudes. Uh, Here in the Beatitudes, Jesus is speaking to his earliest followers, and he's showing them what the life of repentance looks like. Uh, uh, That is the life where they've turned from rejecting God to living for him to entrusting their lives to him, uh, to having him as the king over all they do instead of themselves. And so if you're a Christian here uh, this morning, these words are for you. Uh, They're an invitation to enjoy the goodness of kingdom living under Christ's loving rule. But that's not to say Uh, If you're here this morning and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, that there's nothing here for you. Uh, Because although Jesus is speaking directly to his earliest followers, actually there's also a crowd of interested onlookers gathered around him. And they're listening in to Jesus' revolutionary countercultural teaching. And we read a little bit later in Matthew's Gospel that they were amazed at what they heard. And so my prayer for you, if you're here looking in on Christian things, on the uh, edges like that crowd perhaps, is that as you see the goodness of kingdom living, you'll be blown away by this king and what it is he has to teach. And maybe even wanting to start to live that life of repentance yourself. Okay, that's where we are. Let's dive in. How are the meek blessed? How are the meek blessed? blessed. Well, in a bit, we'll think about how we can cultivate this blessing, and we'll see that actually in just being meek, there is blessing for us. But first, we're going to focus in on exactly what Jesus said, that the the meek will inherit the earth. Uh, That is, they will inherit the future new creation, the world made right, uh, that Jesus will bring about when he returns. And he says that the meek will inherit that. And I think another way of thinking about that I found helpful this week is that uh, a meekness, it's like a posture that enables you to receive from God. Let me say that again. Meekness, it's the posture that enables you to receive from God. And so when you're teaching a child to uh, catch a ball, well, the first thing you have to do is, is teach them the posture they need to uh, take so that they're in a position to receive the ball. The, um, the rugby club that our girls play for uh, in, with the little ones, they spend a lot of time talking about bare hands. 
they say to the, all the toddlers, if you're going to catch the rugby ball, you have to have bare hands. If your hands are in your pocket or pulled up your sleeves or, or even just hanging in front of you, you're in no place to receive the ball. It will come at you and whack you in the face. But if, you're in, if you've got your bare hands out, uh, you're in the right posture to receive. And when that ball comes near you, uh, you'll catch it. You'll do well. And just like the kids having bare hands, ready to receive uh, the rugby ball, so it is with meekness. It's the right posture to have, to receive from God. Uh, why is that? Well, with meekness comes humility, comes the recognition that, that you actually don't have everything sorted, or, or indeed that you don't bring anything to the table. And meekness, it stops us from despising things that seem to be weak. So meekness can look to the cross of Jesus Christ. And it sees not the pitiful death of this weak individual whom so many had put their hope in. But rather, meekness can see the powerful delivery of that hope. And then with meekness, there comes that gentleness that's, that's open to receiving, that doesn't feel the need to grasp and grab, but rather is willing to be given to receive. And, and all that matters as a posture because of how the earth is to be received. Did you notice what it was that Jesus said? Blessed are the meek. Not because they will earn or win or take, but inherit the earth. And if you're going to inherit something, well, you need to be part of the family. And if you're not in the family to begin with, there's no amount of grasping or no amount of impressiveness that you can bring to the table that can make that adoption happen. Now, being, being adopted, it's, it's a gift, something we don't earn, don't deserve. And meekness is that sort of bare hands posture which enables us to receive that gift. And beyond that, the wonderful inheritance that comes with it. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. They won't get left behind, as it were, in this broken, painful world. There's no, none of the struggles of Lavender Hill in the new creation. Uh, it's the world made right and the world open uh, to those who are meek. So I guess the next question we want to ask is, well, how do we cultivate that sort of blessing? How do we enjoy it and have it grow in our lives? And to answer that, we're going to turn back to Psalm 37 and those verses from the beginning of that psalm on page 563 that Andrew first read for us. And the reason we go back to Psalm 37 is actually because of that last verse, verse 11, uh, which Jesus is sort of picking up and running with in the Beatitudes. What does it say, verse 11? But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Now, in Psalm 37, uh, you'll notice it speaks of the land, not the earth. And actually, the land in view is the physical land of Israel. And, and given all that's going on in the Middle East earlier and what we were praying about uh, a second ago, and that all being in part fueled by a sort of Zionist support of Israel. Uh, let me just say a few words about that before we go uh, any further and just think a bit about the question of, well, how should Christians think of the physical land of Israel? Uh, three connected thoughts. Num number one, I think the best way we can understand the Old Testament promises to God's exiled people of returning to the land from their exile in Babylon, the best way of understanding them is that they were fulfilled in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, a few years ago, we were looking at 
uh, the book of Nehemiah and how God brought his people back and re-established them uh, in that land. And that was how the, the sort of culmination of all those uh, promises. Okay, number one. Uh, number two, there's a New Testament, therefore. It doesn't have the same focus on the physical land of Israel. But rather, it proclaims the blessings of God to his people scattered across the nations. And those blessings aren't realized in the temple or in Jerusalem, but in Jesus Christ. And so thirdly, the sort of foundational promises that God made to his people right back to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, that they would enjoy living as his people in his place, under his rule. Well, those promises are no longer bound by geography. And wherever they are, God's people can enjoy living as his people, under his rule, uh, as they look forward to our ultimate homecoming when all of God's people from all the nations will be gathered together in the new creation. And so all of that means that while Jewish people should be protected from anti-Semitic hatred, and I think should be allowed to occupy some of their historic territories, there's no divine right to all of Israel. And so therefore Palestinians likewise should be protected from attack and allowed to occupy their historic homelands as well. I know it's a big, difficult subject and happy to speak more about it later, but here's the short version. When we read in Psalm 37 of the land, the Christian should understand that as speaking of the new creation to come. And so with that in mind, let's experience, uh, sorry, explore how we can experience the blessing of meekness. And Psalm 37, these opening verses give us three ways to do that. Uh, here's the first thing that Psalm 37 invites us to do. It invites us to not fret when we see injustice in the world, but rather to trust that God will put it right. Uh, So have a look, verse 1 of Psalm 37. David writes, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Uh, Or verse 7, further down the page, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Do you hear what David is saying? He's saying when you see injustice and wrongdoing in the world, don't fret, don't get wound up or stressed out when those with questionable morals uh, get on at work uh, or become envious when People's wicked schemes succeed and they prosper as others are crushed. And David says, don't fret. Why? Because this way of things happening won't last. Verse 2 tells us they'll they'll wither away, uh, just like the grass over on Putney Common will do uh, if we have a few more days of sunshine. They'll just wither away to nothing. It won't last. And if we do what verse 7 tells us to do, to wait patiently on the Lord, well, as we wait patiently on him, he will put things right. He'll do verse 6. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. You see, not only will he bring justice upon those who ignore him, but he'll vindicate those who follow him. And so trusting in that God means, secondly, that we can cultivate the blessing that comes from meekness when we don't retaliate in the face of injustice done to us, but again, rather trust that God will see that justice is done. Now, I know, and 
indeed David knows, that the natural response to being wronged is to get angry. And because David knows that, he writes in verse 8, Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. As one writer puts it, he says, don't meet evil with evil. Because to do that is to surrender to evil. Or in the wisdom of the playground, uh, two wrongs don't make a right. And we can do that. We cannot get angry. We cannot retaliate because God will put things right. Uh, we can hope in the Lord, and as the end of verse 9 says, those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. You see, we don't need to retaliate. But we don't need to take justice into our own hands because the just judge will bring about a just world. Let me apologise for bringing uh, the European football back up. Uh, maybe you're still getting over the pain of what happened on Sunday evening, or maybe you're sort of breathing huge sighs of relief that football's done for a little while longer. Um, but so many footballers in that tournament were an example of exactly not, uh, what not to do, uh, as they made a meal of absolutely every tackle, and they did all they could to try and get a free kick award. And I think this is my favourite uh, example of that in the final. It's a bit tricky to see, but the guy on... Uh, the right of the screen, Spanish defender Emiric Laporte. He was knocked over from behind uh, when his teammate fell over. And, and it seemed his instincts to try and win a free kick went so deep that not knowing he'd been pushed over by a teammate, he sort of writhed around on the floor for a bit like he'd been taken down by the worst tackle of the tournament. That instinct to get justice, to persuade the referee that something that was dreadful has happened to me uh, runs so deep that even when our teammate falls into us, we sort of, ah, oh, on the floor for a bit. See, when we don't trust the referee, when we don't trust the judge to do what is right, we have to take matters into our own hands and do all that we can to try and bring about that um, justice ourselves. But Psalm 37 says we don't need to do that. We don't need to do the spiritual equivalent or... Uh, sort of ethical equivalent of writhing around on the floor. Instead, we can cultivate meekness by not retaliating when we're wronged, by trusting that there is a just judge who will ensure that justice is done. So we don't need to fret. We don't need to worry. Psalm 37, it says, we, we cultivate meekness when we don't fret in the face of the injustice we see in the world, but rather trust that God will put it right. And we, we cultivate meekness if we don't retaliate when we face that injustice personally. But again, trust that God will see justice done. But that trust in a God who will put things right doesn't mean that we never do anything. It doesn't mean that with that T-shirt from earlier, we say it was all right with everyone else uh, after everything we do or say. Because actually, meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not being a pushover. Because the third way that Psalm 37 tells us to cultivate our meekness is to do good and to seek justice because of our trust in the God who will put everything right. Uh, that's the message of verse 3 of Psalm 37, which invites us to trust in the Lord and do good. In other words, that trust, it leads to action. It leads to us thinking, well, if this is the trajectory of history... Maybe God can use me to get us a bit closer to the destination. Or verse 4, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. 
If we delight in the Lord, if we align what we want with what he wants, if what he delights in becomes what we delight in, then he will give us those delights. And again, it may be in the future when that new creation comes. Or it may be in the present that he works through us to bring his kingdom here on earth. As we do that, as we align our, our desires with his, we're, we're sort of cutting with the grain of God's purposes in the world and with the direction of history. And then when we commit our ways to the Lord, verse 5, when we commit ourselves to him, when we trust in him, he will do this. He will do what? Well, it's that verse 6 again. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. You may get laughed at in this life for looking to do good, for seeking justice. But Psalm 37 says, no, you will be vindicated for that. You will be shown to be right. And what might that look like? What might it look like to cultivate meekness by doing good and seeking justice because of our trust in God? Well, here's what meekness in action looks like. It looks like using whatever power that we have, not in a sort of lashing out way, but in a controlled way, and not to retaliate to our personal affronts, but rather to help others in their injustice, uh, in the injustice that they face. I, I said earlier that one of the ways the New Testament translates this word, we have meek here in Matthew 5, is gentleness. And one of the places you see that translation is in uh, Galatians 5, as it comes as part of the fruit of the Spirit, something we looked at 18 months or so ago here at church. And, well, I won't get through it all because it's literally a whole other sermon. But uh, Ben, we were exploring how meekly doing good and seeking justice uh, led to the restoration of sinners. And it led to opponents being gently corrected by the truth of the gospel. And it, and it led to gently sharing our faith with others. Sinners restored. Opponents corrected. People brought home into the kingdom of God. All done by meek, gentle power, under control, in the service of other people. If you'd like to think a bit more about that, I've stuck uh, the link to that sermon in our back catalogue at the bottom of um, the sermon sheet there, the running order. Meekness is cultivated as we do good and seek justice because we're trusting God and because we're trusting that he will bring about a world in which wrong is put right. And I wonder, as, as we come to a close, can you see how this sort of meek living isn't just a blessing because the meek will inherit the earth? And that is an incredible future blessing that Christians have to look forward to. But actually, this sort of meek living is good for us in the here and now. And why is that? Well, it's because it frees us from the fretting and the stressing, and the getting wound up at injustice. And it frees us from having to take matters into our own hands and, and put everything right for us because no one else is going to. It frees us from all that worry. While at the same time freeing us to use any power we do have in a sort of controlled way that, that isn't out of self-interest, <coughs> but is actually for the good of others as we follow in our Saviour's footsteps. Because after all, what did his gentle meekness ensure? Well, it secured an internal inheritance for all who trust in him. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, let me lead us in a prayer, thanking God for the truth of Jesus' words and asking that we might all share uh, in that blessing. Uh, let's pray together. 
Our Father in heaven, your ways really are not our ways. And if our world was writing uh, the Beatitudes, we would not read, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And yet in your kingdom and in your economy and in your way of doing things, that is wonderfully true. And so we pray, please, that you might give us all that bare hands posture, that meek posture that's ready to receive from you, that's ready to be adopted into your family, that we might inherit the earth, that we might enjoy life in your perfected new creation. And we ask, Father, that one of the ways you might give us that meekness is by cultivating it in our lives, by giving us that deep trust that although there's so much to lament in this broken world, you will put things right and you will see that justice is done. And whether that wrong is done to us or done to others, Father, help us to trust that you will see justice done. And from that place of trust, we, we pray, please, that you would help us be those who do good and who seek justice. Through whom uh, you answer that bit of the Lord's Prayer, let your kingdom come. Give us eyes to see uh, where we can be instruments in your hands to bring about uh, healing and restoration and um, justice in our broken world. And give us the, the trust and the grace we need to seek those things. And we ask all this. Uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.